As we consider John at his Lord's side, we are very mindful of three events that Jesus specifically shared with John. And not just John, but his three closest ones with Peter and James and John. And the first of them was the raising of Jairus's daughter. Christ was the first to bring life from the dead since the days of Elisha. John, the apostle, had already seen other resurrections from Christ. He'd seen the widow of Nain's son raised. He'd seen Lazarus. But this one was special, as he records it. This one was special because he was right there. He was right next to it. He was just metres away. This girl was just there. And John, as he records this, remembers seeing a dead body, a body that had stopped breathing for some time, start to breathe again. I was there, said John. I was just there. And therefore he could write in John chapter 1, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The Lord of life was here. And the second occasion was the transfiguration. Peter, James and John climbed the Mount Hermon, the heights of that mountain, and were eyewitnesses of Jesus' future majesty. And it was almost certainly at night, and they saw Christ's face shine like the sun. His raiment was white as light, a scene of unearthly radiance. It was absolutely beautiful. With him were Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, and then together they heard those wonderful words, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. And in this transformation, Jesus had a foretaste of that state which was to be his beyond the cross. And that's why John could write in John chapter 1 and verse 14, We beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Two amazing occasions. But what about the third? On that last night, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley into the Garden of Gethsemane. Deliberately a garden, in deliberate contrast to that garden where long ago the battle against sin had been lost. And we note the repetition, if we just turn back a page to chapter 18, verse 1, we note that there were exactly five specific references to this garden. If you don't have these coloured in, it's very worthy, worthwhile to get a pencil and do this. Chapter 18, verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the book Kedron, where was a garden? Reference number one. Chapter 18, verse 26. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did not I see thee in the garden? Number two. Chapter 19, and verse 41. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden reference 3, and in the garden, reference 4, a new sepulchre wherein was never man yet laid. And finally, chapter 20, verse 15, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, reference 5, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, Tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Brothers and sisters, none of the other gospel writers pick that up. None of them. None of them talk about a garden. John does. Five times. And in the garden, Jesus needs to pray. He's about to be bloodied. 
He's about to be bruised and he goes to offer his last prayer to his God before he is arrested. And he takes three, Peter, James and John, with him a little further on from the rest. Peter, who literally just minutes before had protested, though everyone forsake you, Jesus, I will never, ever, ever forsake you. All these will fall away, I won't. And James and John, who just recently had said, Jesus, we can drink of your cup. We can be baptised with the baptism that you can be baptised with. No problems, Jesus. And he takes those three with him by his side a little bit further. He selected the three who had the most boldly professed that they would serve Christ to the end and Jesus wanted them and he needed them at the time of his greatest need. I'm needing your help, he says. I'm finding this tough. Can you live up to your bold claims? And Jesus prays, please, Father, take this cup from me. And in agony he prayed, even more earnestly, brothers and sisters, sweat pouring down like great drops of blood to the ground. And in Jesus' anguish and travail, at the time of his absolute greatest need, they failed him and they all slept. And yes, it would have been the early hours of the morning And yes, it had been a tough week, but when Jesus needed the most, brothers and sisters, when he needed some support on this earth, when we needed someone at his side, they slept. Not once, not twice, but three times. Oh, John. And the occasion is recorded in Matthew, Mark and Luke, But John doesn't mention this at all. It's it's not in this record. Why is that, brothers and sisters? Because he didn't see it. He slept and you might say, well, hang on, he didn't actually record Jairus either. The others did. And he didn't record the transfiguration. The others did. And that is true. But for a man who dedicated the last nine chapters of his gospel to these events, wouldn't you have liked to read that prayer at the hands of John in this gospel? But he couldn't, because he didn't hear it. You think of John 17, which we read just yesterday in our daily readings, and the beautiful entry into our Lord's mind as we read a whole chapter dedicated to a prayer, one of the most beautiful prayers on record that just opens up the Son of God and his mission for us Thank you, John, for recording that. Wouldn't you love to have read about the prayer of the Son in the garden in all of its details? But he slept when our Lord needed him most. So in these three events, John was taught with Peter and James, Jesus had power over death. He was Lord of life as he saw in the raising of Jairus' daughter. Secondly, that Christ would reign in glory, not witnessed on earth, as he saw from the transfiguration. But tragically, they would not comprehend the cross that came first, the anguish, the immediacy, and they slept. But the Jews weren't sleeping. Judas and the Soldiers arrive, and if we leave something in John, let's come back to Mark and chapter 14. Mark 14 and verse 43. And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, 
And Jesus has already spoken about this. He's already predicted this event. And way back in verse 27, he'd already told them, verse 27, Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. You'll all leave me. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. In fact, Jesus said in John's record in chapter 16, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and you'll leave me alone. And in fulfilment of that, in Mark 14 and verse 50, we read, And they all forsook him and fled, every single one of them. When the going got tough, the tough ran away. And Jesus was all alone. He did not have, at this point, a single friend. From here on, no man would be of any help whatsoever. They had all left him. He was on his own. Now, when we come back to John, and we'll, we'll jump to John 18, we find that the Apostle John and Peter follow from a distance. John 18 and verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. So John, it's certainly John, John the other disciple was known to the high priest and the servants. And so he got in. And he let Peter into the palace as well. And the servant says in verse 17, Hey, you, aren't you also one of them? Aren't you also one of his disciples? So she knew that John was a disciple. John had always witnessed. He had always been open. He had always been happy to proclaim, I am of Christ. And he still was even in the house of the high priest, even on Christ's arrest. Yeah, I'm a disciple. But what did Peter do? No, I don't know the man. Who are you talking about? Jesus, who's that? I've never heard of him before. And in the pressure of the situation, Peter rejects his master. Not so, John. Have you noticed John's resolve? Have you ever contemplated what this man did right to the end? He was there in the palace right at the end. And then if we pick up our reading, which happens to be today's daily reading, by a special coincidence, John 19. And we might pick it up in verse 16. Then delivered he them, him, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. They took Jesus. And that word took there, John only uses three times in his gospel. The first of them was all the way back in chapter 1, when he says in verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. It's the same word. They rejected him in chapter 1. They received him not. But John says, not here they didn't. They were very happy to receive him. They took him and they led him away to crucify him, says John. What disgraceful irony. They had rejected him and then received him to kill him. And Simon of Cyrene helped carry the cross not Peter, not John. John would have watched this. He would have seen that from afar. He would have thought, that should be me. It could be me. I wish it was me. I want to help Christ carry his cross. But he didn't. And another man carried that to Golgotha. And they crucified our Lord Jesus Christ, the plan, the logos, the destiny, 
the Word made flesh. The Word tabernacled amongst us. It dwelt with us and his family, his people, killed the Word tabernacling amongst us. And in chapter 19 and verse 19, Pilate writes a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Verse 20, this title was read, many, read by many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin, three languages Jesus dying for people from all nations. Everyone could read it. Here is the King of the Jews. And finally, after all of that, John comes to the foot of the cross. The only one. The only one of the twelve. Every other chosen disciple had abandoned their Lord and John is there, watching his master, watching the nails through the dark of the time. And as he looks up to Christ on the pole, he notices two other people, one on his left, one on his right, criminals, robbers. And his mind goes back and he thinks, that's where I wanted to be with my brother James. We wanted to be there. We wanted to be on his left and his right. That was our ambitious goal, to be on his side. And I've let him down and my brother's not even here. Weren't we undeserving of that place? And it's as if Jesus is saying, John, if you want to rule with me, you have to start at the foot of the cross, not by my side. We read in John 19 in verses 23 and 24 that they split up his clothes, casting lots for the one piece seamless tunic. Brothers and sisters, since the time that Mary had first wrapped her newborn in swaddling clothes, don't you think she would have dressed him ever since? Every year, maybe, there would have been a new cloak, some new garments. The Son of Man would never wanted a new coat from his mother. Had she made this one-piece tunic for him? Did she watch them part Jesus' clothes that she had provided him over the years? Did she watch as the four soldiers triumphantly take the seamless tunic and by lots cast and work out who would take it home and one of them triumphantly takes it and runs away? The cloak that she had lovingly made for her son. Imagine Jesus watching his clothes being taken by others. There's nothing more final than that, is there? I won't be needing them again. And as the garments had been given to him from swaddling clothes through to his final maturity, so garments were given back. Jesus hadn't been born with anything. He hadn't owned anything. He didn't die with anything. Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked he returned. Now in John 19 and verse 25, we find John with four women. Verse 25, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and fourthly, Mary Magdalene. And brothers and sisters, the astute John mentions Jesus' mother five times. And if you've got another colouring pencil, it's, it's worthwhile colouring them in too because a pattern is emerging. 
Verse 25, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, first reference. And his mother's sister, second reference. Mary, the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother, third reference. And the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, fourth reference. Woman, behold thy son. Then he saith to the disciple, behold thy mother. Five references. Surely deliberate. And brothers and sisters, I just feel that John's mind did this deliberately as an echo for the start of the Gospels. The other three Gospels had already been written. John had read them. John was conversant with them. He knew what they wanted to achieve. And he's, he's creating an echo here, right at the end of the four Gospels, with the start. Come back with me to Matthew chapter 2. Just leave something in John. Come back with me to Matthew and chapter 2. You're going to need another colour. Matthew 2 and verse 11. When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. They saw the boy Jesus with Mary. If you're colouring, colour that in. The young child with Mary, his mother. Verse 13, And when they departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother. Second reference. Verse 14, So he arose and he took the young child and his mother. Third reference. Verse 20, Saying, Arise and Take the young child and his mother. Fourth reference. And verse 21, And so he arose and took the young child and his mother. Five references. And John is creating a picture here. He's, he's tying together the start of the Gospels with the end. And so we see this composite picture of Five references to the woman in Matthew 2 and John 19. Five references to the son, the seed, the seed of the woman. Five references to the garden. John is recreating an Old Testament picture. He's deliberately recreating the picture of Genesis 3 with the number of grace Genesis 3 is being fulfilled and the serpent was about to bruise the head, the seed rather, of the woman's heel. But before the serpent would have its short-lived victory, a carer for Jesus' mother needed to be found. If we come back to John 19, We find in those wonderful verses that we've perhaps already coloured that he says, Woman, behold thy son, and to the disciple, behold thy mother. And so he appoints his first cousin John, his confidant, the one he loved, the one who perhaps got him the most, the one he could most closely relate to, to care for his mum. And now the Son of Man could die, knowing that his mother would be looked after. And John would have cared for her his whole life. There's no record of John travelling on great missionary journeys while Mary was still alive. He generally stayed at home. And surely he provided for her. Surely he looked after her. Surely he cared for her in her age. Surely he was present when she died. Surely he buried her. And surely the son looked down from his father's right hand and said, Thank you, John. 
You know, the only woman that John refers to as a mother in his entire gospel is Mary. The, the only woman that he refers to as a mother is Mary. There's only one other mention, and it's, it's, it's a conceptual reference in John chapter 3 by Nicodemus about a man going back into his mother's womb. Every other mother in John is talking about Mary. Even his own mother, Salome, at the cross is titled Mary's sister. The only mother is Mary. And that's the respect that he had for the mother of the Son of God. And then in verse 30 of John 19, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He hears the last cry and then there's no more breathing. The other records merely state that there was a loud cry. John records what Jesus said, it is finished. Why? Because he was there. He heard it. And we know that. Let's come down to verse 35. He that saw it, bear record. I was there, he says. You can believe me because I was an, I was an eyewitness. His record is true. He knoweth that he saith true. what he saith is true, that ye might believe. I was there, says John. I heard Jesus say that. It is finished. And John could later write in 1 John 3, verse 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And John watched it. Every single breath, every cry, he heard it and he felt it. And he saw the breathing stop and he saw his Lord die for him. And so as we stand with John at the foot of the cross, we see the kindest, most noble, most wonderful, most upright man who had ever lived, who spent his life in service to others, who spent in life in service for us, die on a stake. And they laid him in a tomb, and finally the Son of Man had somewhere to lay his head. But the story doesn't stop there, does it? The story of John, the story of Christ, the story of our redemption doesn't finish with a dead king. Because very, very, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, no one else was moving, the city was quiet. A woman got up, Mary Magdalene, and went to the tomb. And the tomb would have been dark, and it would have been hard, and probably cold, and desperately unwelcoming. But the tomb was empty. And she runs to Peter and John. They've taken him away, the Lord, out of the sepulchre. We don't know where they have laid him, she says. And so Peter and John run to the tomb. Let's pick that up in chapter 20. And verse 6, Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. They run to the sepulchre, to the tomb, and they see it's empty as well, because the tomb could not hold the Son of God. But John goes further than that because John's perceptive and he gets it. Look at how he describes the state of the tomb. Verse 6, Then cometh Simon Peter following him, went into the sepulchre, and he seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. John is very careful to record what happened. So the linen body clothes that covered Christ's whole body were just laying there by itself. It's almost like 
your teenager has got up on a Saturday morning and thrown his pyjamas on the bed if they get there. They're just, the linen clothes are just there. But not so the head. The head has been carefully, intricately wrapped up, roll by roll by roll and carefully placed in a place all by itself. John got that. And John got that the head was now clearly and discernibly different from the body. Christ the head is now the king of the world. He towers above the body in importance. And he's alive for evermore. And later on in our memorial service we'll have some choral pieces that will allow us to, to celebrate and to, to meditate on that resurrection. And so, brothers and sisters, as Adam had slept and given life to Eve in Genesis 2, so Christ had slept and facilitated life for his bride, even life eternal. And Peter and John believed and they went home. And we too can believe. Like them at that point, we haven't seen our Lord, have we? But we believe. We know. We know he is alive. And this morning we have as a token of his life, of his presence, the bread of his body and the wine of his life-giving blood. Our absent Lord is with us even now. He was dead, but he is alive again. Thank you.